Hello, I'm Carol Reynolds, and I'm here with the Wind Notes for the Dallas Winds. And I have the absolute joy of interviewing, so to speak, our soloist, the man for whom this concerto by John Mackey was, was written, and you will be bringing it to the world. Hello, Julian Bliss, and thank you for being with me. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's getting close, isn't it? The premiere of this piece. And this, how does that feel to have someone who is a friend as well as a professional colleague write this piece going step by step with you, as, as I understand, and you're going to bring it to fruition? How does that feel? It feels incredible. Uh, first of all, it's a real honor to have someone like John write a clarinet concerto and, and write it for me. Um, I've been an admirer of, of him and his music for many years. And over, over that time, I, I started to think it would be really nice. It would be amazing to have a concerto written by him, mainly because we need as much repertoire as we can get. And to have contemporary uh, popular composers write for the instrument is, is very inspiring for, for clarinetists. And... I hope that everybody, every young clarinetist hearing this will want to learn it and want to play it. And it's very important to to continue to grow the repertoire and to keep having new music out there. Um, it's been uh, amazing to see it come to fruition after the first meeting that John and I had. And also kind of seeing how him and I have got to know each other better over that time as well. And you know, once in a while, he'll send me little snippets of, of music that he's written uh, and some MIDI clips. And then to, to hear it all together is is amazing. And I, I just cannot wait to perform it and share it with everybody. And, and will there be other performances that you will do of it uh, shortly thereafter? Yes, there are. We're, uh, I'm performing it in, uh, in Waco with uh, Baylor uh, and then performing it again with them, I think, in December uh, another five times on the way up to the Midwest Band and Orchestra Clinic. Uh, and then there's a, a couple of performances next year. There's one uh, with the United States Air Force Band, which is incredible, uh, as well as some others, uh, other universities that are uh, part of the uh, consortium. So, I mean, to be honest, it's thanks to them and thanks to every every group, every university, every band and every person that has joined that consortium in order to make it happen. And so my thanks goes to all of them because without them, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Well, we don't have the kings and queens commissioning music anymore the way we would have, you know, our forefathers two, 200, 300 years ago, right? So it, it's it's a new way. And it's exciting though, because you're immediately connected to so many audiences. It, it strikes me at least. It um, is. It's a very exciting way of doing it. And, and, I'm in awe of the uh, the band world, if you like it, over over in America. It's unlike anything else, really. And to see the well, the size of it first of all, but also the sense of community at the same time um, is really admirable. And it's it is a really great and very large family. Um, and seeing everybody come together uh, to commission new works is. Is, in, is is amazing and it's it's what it should be about really before i have you say a bit about the piece per se uh you've had quite a life with the clarinet and one that started early and i i have to say this to anyone who doesn't know your website which if i'm not mistaken is julianbliss.com is that correct that's correct yes yeah your website is fabulous and one of the things oh, i like you. Well, it's fabulous because you put so much up for persons who find you and not just about this uh, amazing career you've had playing with orchestras, playing the classical repertoire for all these years. I mean, not too many years, but, you know, a lot of years since you were a kid. Right. But then you have your septet. So I um, you you have a double life in many ways. And or is it just a great integrated force that you feel for your instrument and your love of music? I guess in in some ways, some people could think of it as two two separate entities, if you like, a jazz and classical side. But in many ways, at least in my mind, I I see it as um, I, I just want to play good music. Um, yes, of course, there are the obvious differences between jazz and classical, but it's I, I enjoy both 
uh, equally. Uh, of course, I've done classical for many more years uh, in comparison to jazz, but um, I, I really enjoy both. And I find that playing both those genres can help uh, influence in a positive way each other. Um, so, for example, with the jazz side, having that sense of freedom and improvisation, bringing that into the classical world, I think gives new elements to your playing. Um, well, I'd, at least I'd, I'd like to think so anyway. Um, and I, I, I just enjoy, I enjoy playing both. And uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, it really is. Well, it's wonderful. And I hope everybody who hasn't visited there's, you've given really lots of possibilities to hear a lot of things. And I'm, I, I want to ask you about your, your early background too. But I was just thinking in my own mind, does it change things uh, when you perform? Because because of our modern world, I can click no matter where I am and I can watch you perform all kinds of pieces in all kinds of situations. So in a way, people can know you before you ever walk out of the stage. Is that Does that affect you at all as a performer? Um, certainly the world has changed, um, even since I've been playing professionally, uh, and seeing the very quick, uh, emergence of social media in particular has been a real, uh, change to our industry. Um, you know, these days people can feel a lot more connected to various musicians via their social media channels, um, and putting up little clips of their, of their performances. Uh, and then there's YouTube and other other video platforms as well where you can watch full length concerts. Uh, I think the the COVID pandemic also uh, changed things as well because nobody could go to a concert. So suddenly we were reliant on viewing everything on screens and having to stream or have lots of concerts streamed uh, was a bit of a bit of a shift. Uh, it was very odd sometimes performing to a completely empty concert hall but there'll be a lot of cameras there but it's something that you do get used to i think it's great that we try always to reach larger audiences and and wider audiences around around the globe it's it's very important for our for our industry but having said that there's no substitute for having an audience sitting in front of you it really makes the biggest difference uh, to me and to the excitement levels and the way that I perform. If it's a, a, a busy hall, it feels good. Well, it's going to be busy for this piece. I, I know the excitement about it in Dallas and Fort Worth and all the areas around with all those bands, as you say, it is a, it is a happening in Texas, isn't it? Especially it everywhere. Certainly I, is. So um, I, again, I want to ask you to talk about the piece in detail, but let, let me ask this sort of basic biographical question. You had a clarinet in your hand about as long as you can remember. Is that a fair statement or how long? And is it your life? It's been your life. Is that fair? <laughs> it has been. Uh, I've been playing the clarinet now for 29 years uh, of about 33. Yeah, 33 now. So, yeah, I started very, very uh, young. It's somewhat uncommon, I think. To, to start playing a wind instrument at, at the age of four. Um, and it was something that came from me. I, I decided that I wanted to wanted to play music, wanted to, um, and then ultimately play the clarinet. Um, I come from a non-musical family, so it was very much out of the ordinary. But once I, once I had that clarinet in my hands, there was nothing that was going to stop me. Um, not necessarily, I didn't know that I would do it as a career, I mean, of course, why would you at four? Um, but I just I just loved it and took every opportunity I, I could to perform and to play. And I'm very lucky. I feel very lucky that it has now, you know, something I enjoy so much has, has become my career. Um, I feel very fortunate in that. Wow, that is exciting. And sort of all these kids, especially sometimes children think, well, I don't have anybody in my family that's, you know, I mean, some people have, their parents are conductors or, or composers or playing fancy string quartets and you didn't have that and you had something inside that worked just for you right i guess i guess so yeah somewhere <laughs> yeah well that's 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 i think something kids also need to know that um you it's there the path is there okay 
this piece, I have had the pleasure of talking to Mr. Mackey about this piece um, a few days ago. And of course, I need to tell you how he, um, how intensely he describes things and with what excitement. And he described a little bit about the back and forth. And his, if I took anything away from that, it would be that he would do all that work to get parts to you, of course, early and get your opinion. And bingo, you'd have it right back with a whole new, sometimes even a whole new vision. And there he was again, right back. Uh, and not, you know, I mean, what was that dynamic like? Did you see it that way? How did it feel to you? It felt, it was great. And I eagerly awaited anything that he would send me. And anytime I would get a, a, a MIDI clip or a, a little snippet, I would listen to it straight away or read it through straight away. Um, I, I, I couldn't wait. I just had to, because I was so excited. I just had to hear it and play it. Um, I, I tried to not really give, give too many. Um, I, I gave a couple of thoughts and a couple of ideas, if you like. But to me, it's he's the one that is that is composing it of course and so it's it's not really my place to to then put too much of of my ideas if if you like now if there are some some sort of technical things or uh, suggestions of or maybe this would work better uh it, technically in this register or that one then then yes i i would suggest it but the overall arc of the piece and and the the musicality and the ideas that's that's completely john and i I really like it that way. I, I like the back and forth. Um, and pretty much anything he sent to me, I was, yeah, that's great. Um, and he said, oh, you, is this is this not too hard? Are you sure? I was like, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll find a way of playing it. You know, that's, to me, that's that's our job. Um, the composer writes what, what they want to write, and it's then our job to figure out a way to play it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's been fun. It's been fun. There was a... One or two things, I think he sent me a text message. Oh, can you flutter tongue on a high F? And with the time difference, I think I got that at midnight. And so here I am in this room trying to flutter tongue on a high F, sent him a little video saying, yep, it's, it's just about possible. OK, well, that's in the piece. Um, so it was it, it was fun. It was a real fun process, actually. And I I loved hearing any anything that he possibly could send me um, and yeah, it was really nice to see the evolution of the piece as well. That's that's wonderful. Well, the piece tells quite a story. It has, as you called it, an arc, and it's a it's a wonderful story, a surprising story. It's still based in a lot of traditional um, concepts and archetypes of stories. So, how do you feel about? Or I, I'm using this word "feel," but how in your mind you're running some of that story? I presume, or though I don't know. What's going on with that arc of that story in your thought as you play this intense piece? Uh, definitely, you have to you have to have that in your in your mind. And and the nice thing with with composers these days is you can ask them. Um, <laughs> it's not like we have to imagine. Well, what was he thinking when he or she thinking when they wrote this? Um, mm. And with John, I can ask. Well, what what is this piece? Uh, this this part relate to or what's what's this trying to say um i think the most important thing with us musicians and when we perform is we have to tell the story uh and but without saying anything of course we have to tell the story through just the way we play or the the inflection on a certain phrase and so of course boy. i'm i'm sorry i should but aren't you kind of a bad boy in this piece is that fair? Uh, yeah it seems to be <laughs> it seems that. that way i'm gonna have to try and channel that somehow um yeah certainly a, 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 a trickster a lot of a lot of pranks a lot of uh yeah there's a lot going on there's a lot in it so i'm gonna have to channel a lot of those uh a lot of those those emotions and those uh those feelings if you like or those characters um and that's really fun. And, and through the, the practice process, I've, I've really been thinking about that. Uh, and I, I just hope it comes out in the performance. Does that, um, does that whole issue of, of narrative in music, as you were just saying, um, how does a student who's in some ways light years away from what you'll be doing on that stage, how, if you were, how do you, bring or give and I, mean, I know you've done a lot with developing instruments 
and that I find fascinating to read about. You maybe you could say a bit about that. But when you, I'm sure you work with a lot of students too, and and they may feel technically since they can't do all of these things yet, they can't tell a story. But what are some of the things you would say to a student who has a different story to be telling at a very different level? Can can you bring some of that at, at a younger and less technically advanced level? Of course you can, and and learning and practicing musicality is a vital a vital part. Um, there are a lot of musicians in the world that can play very, that are technically very proficient, but sometimes they lack that, whatever this is, you know, the, the last 5% um, of emotion and, and the, the feeling in the music. And that can be very, very difficult to teach. Um, I think a lot of it is about using your imagination, understanding the music and and especially the harmony um you know for example is does the harmony sound happy is it sad does it sound like there's tension is it growing is it uh going somewhere is it moving um you know from when we're kids we have all of these ideas we we imagine what might be happening along to music um for some reason the the william tell overture just came into my head you know it sounds like someone riding a horse and that's just what it sounds like and so kind of getting that creativity and that imagination going i think is one of the most important um it can be then difficult to put that in whilst you're trying to play and do everything all at once um but starting starting slow starting um with something that's a little bit easier um i think is very good practice um and you know the story might change the what you feel about a piece of music might be one thing now and and something completely different in a year from now um so i think yeah imagination is is really the key um and there are certain things of course you can do when you're practicing you know direction through a phrase or um building tension in terms of dynamics that that can help with that um so there are there are little uh, things you can do and i love doing masterclasses and, and trying to to get more of that out of out of students well and this is such a from what i understand of course you're bringing it to the world for the first time so they'll be hearing it along with everybody else but i know it's going to be a tour de force do you have to do a certain amount of pacing the way a singer would to get through an entire opera do you do you, do you have to remind yourself to pull back or is that just so ingrained in you now to pace all of this certainly as well, i guess when i was young I, I i didn't really consider the the physical aspect of of performing or playing the clarinet um and performing any musical instrument is a is very physical and you have to take into account all of all of these things you know physical physically um psychologically and through practice as well um there's a lot of muscles that you're using and if you don't use them then you will become tired quicker uh, for clarinetists and, and other wind players often it's the the muscles around your mouth the embouchure and so it's just it, it mainly is about being in shape uh, in performing shape um, something which again through the pandemic really uh, really came to came into focus because all of a sudden I wasn't performing it. No one was performing anymore. There were no concerts to be to be had. And practicing at home is entirely different to being performance ready, to being match fit, as we'd say. Um, and there is no substitute for than just performing as much as you can. Um, so, yeah, staying in shape uh, is, is very important for a piece like this. Yeah, there are some some challenging sections, some some parts that are um, yeah, challenging in different ways. Uh, second movement is about holding long uh, lines. There's less places to to breathe than in than in some other pieces, but that's fine. Um, it's about having those really long continuous lines, and so you know having good uh, good breathing, good air support, good air production is very important there. Um, but you know it's not something I really, to be honest, it's not something I really think about too much anymore. Um, but certainly when you are practicing and when you're learning to get to that level of match, match fitness, if you like, um, is, is definitely there. Um, 
but the only way through it is to just continue doing it over and over and over again so it, it, for example with this piece in preparation i i'm now just playing it through repeatedly from beginning to end um and doing that many many times a day just to get a sense of the whole the whole piece wow that's that's exciting i wish we i could be outside your window listening in that would be I don't fun. Know. <laughs> well, well i mean not every day right but some days yeah. um well it i you said it earlier about the real energy and excitement of the Amer especially the American band world, the, the band world in general. A lot of people don't know this. I, I can tell you from my work that I do, how when I tell people about it, I might as well be telling them about another planet that they don't think exists. But it is vital. It is filled with hope. It's reaching kids. And I know you've been very dedicated to reaching even more kids. And I mean, when you think about this, I mean, it, there's a lot to be hopeful about. Am, am I overstating this? No, you're you're right. Um, but quite often, it's easier to focus on the on the things that we can do better at. Uh, I think that's that's just human nature. Um, there is a lot to be very proud of with the American um, music education system, uh, especially compared to other countries. But of course, you, the comparison to other countries isn't isn't always relevant you just want to make it even better in, in within that country and yes there are always things that, that can be that we can do better uh, across the board across the world um, but I've always thought that the way that music um, is is somewhat ingrained into school life in, in the US and yes it does vary depending depending on the state um, is it's very admirable and it, you create so many more music lovers in life whether whether these everybody ends up playing a musical instrument um professionally or, or otherwise is is beside the point but i think you have a lot of people that really appreciate music and appreciate music education and the benefits of music education because they've had it in school um and it's it, it's an amazing world and and it's one i've been more involved in over the last 10 and 15 years and I just want to do even more uh, and as one of the motivations for for commissioning this piece is that there are there are pieces of course for for clarinet and band uh, and there are some incredible concertos by other great contemporary composers but we should continue to to put new repertoire in that in that space in that world um, and I, yeah again I'm just honored that that John agreed to it he he said he always held a clarinet concerto in fairly high regard and like it was an important uh, important piece um so i just hope i i do it justice well i am pretty sure you will uh, that's uh but boy thank you for all you were bringing to it and putting into it and without all of that it does, these things do not happen um so when you take that step out of the stage, you, you've already left this enormous world of effort and time and patience and that people who don't play music really can't quite always grasp. And how could they, right? How could they know that midnight with a flutter tongue, right? <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think sometimes it's, it's good in some ways that, they, that, that people can go and enjoy it and, and enjoy it for what it is, uh, that performance. Um, on the other side, I think for other clarinetists and for other musicians in general, especially young musicians, sometimes it's hard to understand the amount of work that goes into a performance, into a, into a new piece, because you don't see it. You do. You just see the end result. You see the performance. And of course, when we're when we're young and when we're learning, we want to get better as quick as we possibly can. And... I think realizing that it takes a lot of time, uh, a lot of patience, a lot of discipline, um, and a lot of perseverance is is very important. And you you will not you will not progress as quickly as you want to. I can almost guarantee it. Um, but with a little bit every day and, and with clear goals in mind, you will you will get better. And before you know it, you'll look back and you you'll see how far you've come. Um, so I think it's important for musicians, especially on our end, to to really to, to kind of almost be kind to themselves and and realize 
it's going to take some time. Uh, learning a new piece of music can potentially take months uh, to get it to the level that you want. Um, and even then, even when it is at the level that you want, there will always be things you can do better. I'm, I'm almost, I'm, well, I'm not almost convinced. I am convinced that even this first premiere afterwards, there will be things that I feel I can do differently or, or better next time. Um, and that's just, that's just what music is. That's just what it's like. The kind of constant search for perfection. But does perfection even exist? Yeah. Who knows? But it's, well, and, and you're driven and this, it's a perfect combination. Julian Bliss playing John Mackey. I mean, what more could you want is what I think. So I am looking forward to this concert. I hope I hope that we pack the, the roof and the rafters and there's a line out the door because I believe there will be for the double appearance of you and he together in that hall. Um, thank you for making the time to tell us a bit more about it. And I look forward to that day coming quickly. Me too. And it's also a, a real honor to, to be performing with Dallas Wins. It's my first ever performance with them. And ever since I was a kid, I've always, uh, uh, for many years, have, have heard their recordings and, and have known about Dallas Wins as being the premier uh, uh, group. And it's, it's an honor to be performing with them. And I'm, it's kind of a yeah, like you say, for me anyway, to, to be performing in that hall with Dallas Wins and with Jerry Junkin conducting, playing John Mackey. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of a lot of really special people involved. And I'm I, again, I'm just I, I have a huge amount of appreciation and I feel honoured that I'm the one that gets to perform with them and gets to premiere this new incredible piece. Well, we appreciate you sharing those thoughts. And I always say at this point, thank you again. And we'll see you at the concert. Right? I'm looking forward to it. See you there. <laughs> thank you very much, Julian Bliss. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.